I'll let you know it's me. Right. If you don't. I'll probably be last to
for the many new faces I see around uh, the room here. Uh, I'm uh, the president of Peter Skilton, and I've actually been away for the last two months overseas on work, off and on. Uh, so this is my first uh, first meeting back really since uh, before June. Um, those of you who have name tags, please uh, do wear them for the sake of not only uh, we, we members who forget your name, particularly when there are hundreds and hundreds of you, but uh, also for the newer members who are trying to uh, strike up a conversation. Now hopefully my voice will hang out as I'm on the, uh, the tail end of uh, getting over a cold and uh, it's the first time I've had to uh, talk in a, a projected manner for uh, uh, quite a while now. <coughs> Now there's uh, the usual raffle tonight, which is one dollar for a raffle ticket, and uh, the bucket's over there if I uh, can pass it round. Don't feel obliged, but uh, it looks like the prizes are a bottle of uh, whiskey, uh, a book about black holes and time warps, and one on uh, Isaac Newton by the looks of it as well. So that's three prizes. One dollar a ticket to take how many uh, you wish, and that will be drawn uh, around tea break time, after tea break time. Right, well, congratulations to the following members for reaching various milestones. We have Sue Stone has reached a five-year mark of membership. Uh, Les Rains has reached uh, three years. And we have uh, the Everard family, uh, who uh, just joined us. Also, I believe there's a, an R name that uh, we've misplaced all your addresses. So uh, if you can yeah. see me afterwards, then we'll add you to the mailing list. Otherwise, you won't be able to see too many newsletters. Right, there's no idea or question box to hand around at the moment, but I'll uh, see if I can fish that out at um, the break time. As usual, uh, during the break and afterwards, if you wish, the uh, librarians will be uh, next door with all the cupboards, and uh, Andrew will thrust his uh, hand into the air, signifying he's the librarian. If you uh, wish to borrow uh, any books from uh, our growing library, right now, our structure of tonight is uh, we'll uh, I'll give you a bit of a background as to what the society's done since uh, the last meeting. Then uh, Russell Thompson here will give a, an encore performance of uh, Universe in a Nutshell. Yeah. Something like that. Something like that. He'll condense all of astronomy into uh, about, an about an hour, which uh, is no mean feat. Then we'll break for a tea break and reconvene in here for the uh, information sessions. And at the same time, there'll be uh, the Sam Neill video on space going uh, next door. If you haven't actually seen that, that's episode one on uh, live. Mm -hmm. And episode two will be next month, and episode three will be uh, the month after. Now, since we last met, uh, there's only been, uh, well, there may have been two viewing nights, one on uh, August the 2nd, public viewing night at the Rise. We only had about 20 people there, tops. And uh, we were scheduled for a St. Oliver Plunkett School at Camp Manual. Did that actually go ahead? No, no, we, we don't know, so we probably didn't answer it the last time. We, we've never done St. Oliver Plunkett School before, but I honestly couldn't tell you where. Also, since we last uh, met, there was a close pass of an asteroid that we may have heard on the uh, news, which uh, passed about the Earth moon distance away, which in relative terms is uh, quite close. Uh, although there was one last year that passed uh, by at about uh, half that distance, and uh, there was a bit of a concern <coughs> about the actual impact on the Earth, but uh, subsequent calculations showed that not to be the case. Also, since we last met, uh, Dr. Harrison Schmidt came down uh, to the Mornington Peninsula, and those members of the society who were around uh, at the June meeting, sorry, the July meeting on July 17, had a choice of either uh, coming to the dinner with him uh, for the evening, or uh, coming here to the general meeting, so we ran both at the same time. And uh, at the dinner with him at the Mornington Race Course, there were about 360 people present, of which about 70 were from the Astronomical Societies. Uh, basically, ASF members and friends and family had turned up for that to hear him talk. And uh, showing here is uh, a young lad uh, on the right. I'm not sure if he's here tonight. I don't think so. Uh, young Ryan, who I think was about to join the, uh, the ASF at the same time. And he got to uh, to hear about this talk and went along. And uh, he also ended up coming away with uh, Harrison Schmidt's signature. Now, Harrison Schmidt was the last man to walk on the moon. And uh, he was the only geologist, the only scientist ever to actually set foot on the moon. And a uh, very uh, unassuming, quiet character he is uh, as well, considering he's uh, 
one of only 12 men to have ever uh, stepped upon the lunar surface. Uh, since the last time, uh, Sam has also visited the IMAX cinema up in Carlton via two uh, bus trips, uh, I believe, which uh, Sally did a wonderful job uh, organising, and I'm sure there were uh, others that helped to get the buses going again after they broke down halfway uh, uh, getting there. But they went to see the 3D IMAX movie on Space Station, and if you haven't seen that, which is the Tom Cruise narrated one, I very strongly uh, recommend that uh, you do go see it. It's a very good one. Uh, since the last day, it was also a telescope learning day in Luna. I assume Dan will say something about that later on. Uh, I believe there may be astronomy classes coming up again. Uh, yes, I'll announce when I speak later. Um, Do you want to say something? Uh, well, uh, the uh, problem was the finding something to open up the Mount Eliza uh, Community Centre. Uh, there is a chance it might happen on Saturday, September 7th. Uh, depends on whether I'll get the uh, okay or not. I'll have to contact the only for the people who have done one session and to, and to follow up. So it's not a new one for, people, for new people. So I'll, I'll phone the people concerned if I can get it together on that on September the 7th or at the time that I can, depending on. I won't know until this fellow comes back from overseas. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the Overseas, I actually got to go to a planetary walk, and uh, if we get enough time, I'll show you some slides of that uh, tonight. Uh, if not, uh, it'll be something that I'll talk about uh, next month uh, for a while. And what that is is a scale model of the solar system spread out over about seven kilometres, and uh, it really is quite uh, an interesting concept. Since our last meeting, there have been no lunar graze expeditions that I'm aware of that uh, any member has uh, participated in. Uh, I have some uh, updated predictions of uh, Jupiter satellite uh, occultations and eclipses and if any of you are interested in following those or measuring those with your telescopes, really a telescope of any size, then I have spare copies in front that uh, you can feel free to come and uh, take a copy of those predictions which cover the next apparition which uh, is halfway into uh, next year. Right, have there been any member observations of note since we last met? There was an item on the 7.30 ABC News tonight regarding a very large sunspot which has appeared in the last few days. Mm -hmm. They said there was five Earth diameters in the shelf. 69, I think. Yeah, da David here said he's got some photos that he will show <coughs> after the tea break, for those of uh, you having a look at it. Uh, there was quite a prominent sunspot on uh, Saturday at the Telescope uh, Learning Day, and it was a very, very large sunspot. And further to that, there's an aurora lit out for tonight as a, as a result of that sunspot. <coughs> Not that we're going to see it through the cloud, I think. John? Yeah, there was also a few weeks back, or a couple of weeks back, quite a bright comet. Comet 2206, which I advised members of by the society's emails that that was visible fairly easily in binoculars in the early morning. Okay, thanks, John. The, there are a couple of viewing nights. If anyone wishes to put up their uh, put their name on the list um, to come along, one on the 6th of September at Friars, one at the 12th of September. Um, also, I believe, uh, at Baxter, I think, but I'm not sure where, whereabouts in Baxter. Is it on the lots on? Yeah, uh, yeah it's the corner of Grant Road and the back uh, to Turin Road. Thanks. OK, Russell, uh, would you like to come and give your uh, summary to the university? Sure. Why not? OK, it's a little bit of some of you, I guess this might appear as a bit of deja vu, and trust me, it's not because I only did this talk uh, back in March or something. So the fact that uh, I'm repeating it, I hope that means it's a good thing. So, um, but the first thing I'm going to do is work out how to drive this down thing again. So, so if you bear with me just a sec.
control now. So <laughs> Look, I can even make it go fully dark. Have a look at that. <laughs> Exactly how much stuff or how much mass is actually 
uh, family and son. Now, um, I said that um, the, the energy given off the core of the sun is actually in the form of gamma rays and gamma rays only. Well, that's true. You might say, well, okay, but we don't actually see gamma rays. We see all this light and lots of heat. What actually happens is that the, the nuclear reactions are raging in the core and the gamma rays are the, the energy that's given off by those reactions. But as the gamma rays actually travel outwards through the, um, through the uh, structure of the sun, they, that energy gets absorbed into the outer layers of the outer atmosphere of the sun. Um, and uh, that then ends up being re-radiated at lower energy levels in the form of um, primarily visible light, but also infrared radiation and, and UV as well. And it's that visible light that's what we see pretty obviously when we look up in the sky every day. Um, so it's this process of um, uh, uh, gamma rays being given off from the reactions in the core, um, travelling out through the outer layers of the sun, it gets absorbed by the outer layers and then re-radiated as visible IR and UV, UV radiation. And it actually takes a couple of million years, I believe, for the energy to actually um, get radiated out from the core of the sun to it, where it reaches the surface and gets radiated off out into space. Now, um, this is a picture of the sun, and what you can see here is some uh, big sunspots. Sunspots are um, actually uh, magnetic storms caused um, in the atmosphere of the sun. And um, it's important to note that the spots aren't actually black. To, uh, black, it's a purely, purely a contrast effect, okay? The, the fact that the, the surrounding area here is so much brighter than the, uh, the sunspot area that um, that's how we see it. It's purely an, an effect by contrast. Um, here's a nice picture here of um, some of these uh, sunspots. And you can see the, um, the dark centre of the spot here is called the umbra. And around it you can see this sort of light little, little grey area is called the penumbra. And it's interesting that um, the structure of these areas is a bit like um, when you have uh, a magnet to put a piece of paper over the top that can get iron, iron filings. And you can see that the iron filings actually stand up in line with the magnetic flux. Similar sort of things happening here. Uh, when, you, when you look at these structures, it's um, revealing the, um, the, the structure of the sun's magnetic uh, field. That's a bit of an impressive picture. I like that one. Um, that's actually a photograph of the sun taken in, uh, I think it's uh, ultraviolet. And um, you can see here um, uh, material being blasted off out into space, so the sun's quite a, quite a violent sort of a world. Um, this is uh, hot gas in the order of millions of degrees centigrade getting blasted off into space. Um, you also notice this sort of faint reddy glow around here. Um, that reddy glow is actually the sun's corona, which is its outer atmosphere. I'll talk about that in a bit in a, in a second. Uh, this is a, actually a picture of a total solar eclipse. So um, this is actually the moon as it goes in front of the sun, as it happens every uh, so often. There's actually one, uh, or a sort of a, Total one happening in Seduna uh, later this year. Um, so the moon's in front of the sun, and it block, it's blocking out the sun. But what it enables us to do is see this uh, corona flowing out into space. That otherwise the sun itself is too bright; it, it, it blocks out. But when the moon's uh, totally across the face of the sun, we can actually see the structure of the corona, which is uh, nothing more than hot gas. Um, about a million degrees centigrade growth uh, being blasted off out into space, and that's a continual process. Okay, sun contains about 99.8% 99 of all matter that makes up our solar system. The planets, asteroids, comets, you and me, uh, the dog next door make up the rest. Um, at the moment, the sun is about 75% uh, hydrogen, about 25% helium. Other elements, that is oxygen, carbon, iron, Gold, so forth, make up about 0.1%. Uh, temperature cores about 15.5 million, drops to about 5,800 degrees centigrade at its surface. Um, and uh, at the centre of the core of the sun, pressure is about 250 billion times out of Earth's atmosphere. So this is 1G that we're standing in in this room at the moment. But the pressure of the sun is 250 billion times greater than what we're experiencing on our bodies now. And uh, sun's about one and a half million k in diameter, <coughs> and um, that many times more massive than the Earth. Just some basic facts and figures here. Um, I've already talked about the corona. Um, now the sun is actually, or our star system, which is what we've called the sun, and all the planets 
all been rounded. Our star system only has one star, but in actual fact, about a third, I think, of all the stars that we know about actually are multiple star systems. So they might consist of uh, two or even more stars orbiting around each other, orbiting around a common centre of gravity. So if you actually lived on a planet orbiting one of these star systems, you'd actually likely see two stars in the sky. Um, so about a third of all the stars that we can see are of that nature. Um, and the interesting thing is that um, the sun's gravity, or its massive gravity, is the only thing that actually stops it being ripped apart. If you can imagine you've got these raging, enormous nuclear reactions raging in its core, you know, burning 700 million tonnes of fuel a second, like billions of atomic bombs are going off all at once. And the question is, well, why doesn't it just explode to pieces? It's the fact that its massive gravity is trying to do a bear hug to try and uh, collapse it in on itself. And uh, it's when you have an equilibrium, equilibrium where the force produced by the nuclear reactions in the core equals the, um, the, uh, the weight of its own gravity trying to collapse itself. That's what actually holds it as a, as a stable sphere shape, if you like, and enables it to, uh, to uh, exist in a stable state. And uh, the same massive gravity is also responsible for what keeps us and uh, all the other planets and, and asteroids orbiting around it like clockwork. So let's have a look at the rest of the solar system now. That was sort of all the, uh, as, as heavy as the physics gets, so uh, don't worry too much. Um, <coughs> okay, so the known solar system consists of about, of, I shouldn't say about nine planets, of nine planets. We won't go down that, uh, down that mm -hmm. argument. Uh, about 65 known moons, as well as countless asteroids um, and comets. Okay, and they all orbit the sun ranging from distances of about 50 million k's in the case of Mercury, up to about 5 billion k's on average uh, in the case of uh, Pluto. Um, they and us along with them are all just leftovers from the sun's creation. Now this is an interesting point. Um, when the universe was created, um, according to Big Bang Theory, there's only two elements that actually were created at the, at the creation time of the universe, hydrogen and helium. Okay. And most of the universe that we know of is actually made up of hydrogen. Well, the question is, we're made up out of carbon when we're an organic life form. Where did the carbon come from? Um, this table has got steel leaves made up out of iron. Where did the iron come from? So you've got um, two elements that were produced at the very uh, start of the, uh, the universe's existence, hydrogen and helium. Where did everything else come from? Or every, every other element in the periodic table? Well, the answer to that lies at the core of a star. Um, as I've already said, stars actually burn by uh, fusing lighter elements into heavier elements. So they take uh, hydrogen, which is, has one proton, and fuse it into an atom that has two protons, because they're fusing those two protons together to make helium. <coughs> um, and uh, as a star rages, um, that process continues and actually creates heavier and heavier elements. In fact, stars like Betelgeuse at the moment are actually producing carbon. By burning carbon. Um, so the answer is that all the elements uh, <coughs> that we know of beyond hydrogen and helium are actually manufactured in the core of a star. And then some stars, when they end their life, die as a supernova. Um, and then the process of that supernova explosion also creates some more of the, or the, the balance of the remainder of the elements in the periodic table. So the fact is that um, all the elements in, uh, are heavier than helium. Um, and I'm mostly made up out of um, hydrogen, okay? That's created the Big Bang, but I'm also largely made up out of carbon. Well, the carbon that I'm made up from, the atoms that are actually making my skin, the carbon atoms that are constituting my skin, were actually created in the core of a star that existed a long time ago. And then when it exploded in the supernova, seeded those elements out into space. And um, then when the sun came along and formed, and uh, condensed and coalesced from those uh, elements floating around in the space that have been left over from that old star. Um, they've been swept up into the planets, um, swept up into the sun as well. Um, and, um, but in the case of the planets, um, that's essentially what's provided the building blocks and the atoms for what you and I are made up out of. <coughs> so the fact is we're all, uh, we're all <coughs> made up out of stuff that's come out of this core of a star a long time ago which I find quite interesting. Um, here's a bit of a basic diagram of the solar system. Most people have probably seen this. It doesn't come up too well on the big screen. 
Um, so you've got the Sun in the centre, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars are the, uh, the inner four planets, or the rocky planets. And then you've got the outer planets consisting beyond uh, the orbit of Mars, of uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. Sorry, I'm not one of these Pluto uh, people who like to call Uranus, Uranus or Uranus or Uranus that I've heard pronunciations. Uranus. Take it headline. Um, okay, so this is a diagram here. Not a very good one, I'm afraid, but the best I could find on the web. Um, and it sort of, sort of gives you a bit of an idea of the scale of the planets in comparison to the sun. So here's the sun to, uh, to scale. So you've got Mercury, Venus, Moon, uh, sorry, the Earth with its Moon, and Mars. So you've got the four inner planets. And then the uh, four outer gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then Pluto hanging out at the edge. Um, so that gives you an idea for scale. Now we'll talk about a bit of the, the planets. No, we won't. We'll do this for the <coughs> Okay, so the other things we've got in addition to planets are asteroids, which are just basically big lumps of rock and iron floating around that uh, are basically failed planets. They fail to uh, coalesce or condense into, um, into planets. Uh, and most of those asteroids are actually found orbiting in the area between Mars and Jupiter. Um, and comets as well, which are basically just uh, dirty balls of ice and rock um, that uh, actually orbit in highly elliptical paths. So they normally sort of exist far out in the depths of the solar system. Um, and then on a highly elliptical orbit, um, coming close to the sun. And it's only when they come in close to the sun that we can actually see them, but uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, some basic planetary facts. Okay, so you've got the, uh, the nine planets here, distances from the sun. Um, and um, it's interesting when you look at Jupiter and Saturn through the telescope to realise that Jupiter is, at, uh, sorry, Saturn is actually twice as far away as Jupiter. So um, there seems to be like a, a lot of the small planets are in quite close and then the, the distances greatly increase between the planets as you go out further. Um, uh, sizes, the Earth's a, a paltry 13,000 km in diameter. Uh, Jupiter, the largest planet, is about uh, a bit over 10 times that. Uh, and um, Jupiter is still only about a uh, tenth of the diameter of the Sun itself. Um, some ideas for temperatures here. Um, anybody like to suggest why Venus is so hot? Because it's got a uh, massive greenhouse. <coughs> yeah, that's right. Venus's atmosphere is uh, oh, primarily uh, carbon dioxide. And um, as we all know, the, um, the greenhouse effect, carbon dioxide is a gas that actually uh, maintains um, heat quite well. So, and because that atmosphere of carbon dioxide is so dense, the, uh, the radiation from the sun heats it up, but then at night, it, or even during day as well, it can't actually re-radiate back out into space very well. So um, Venus's atmosphere doesn't cool very well, and as a result, um, that's the average temperature on Venus. Mercury's hot um, primarily because it's so close to the sun. Uh, it's only 50 million k's away. Um, so it's extremely hot, but it also is extremely cold at night. Mercury actually has the largest temperature swing of any planet in the solar system. So that's the average temperature at day, and at night it drops to about that. Um, so I don't think uh, Mercury would be a, a good place for a holiday. Uh, and um, the Earth, you can see, has one moon uh, up to uh, Saturn's 20 moons. Now, one of the things that we like to baffle students with at school nights is, uh, well, how many moons does Saturn have and trick them by saying trillions? Well, in actual fact, that's sort of right, because um, Saturn's rings are actually made up out of tiny particles of dust orbiting the Saturn. So I guess it depends on what you want to call a moon to be uh, to look at uh, technical definitions. But uh, for me, I'm happy enough saying 20 moons. So there you go. Um, and the other interesting thing is too, once you get out as far as uh, Neptune and Pluto, temperature at Pluto, particularly when it's at its outer orbit from the Sun, which is about 6, six uh, billion k's from the Sun, Minus 235, that's not a heck of a lot above absolute zero, that is absolutely freezing. In fact, it's below the freezing temperature of liquid nitrogen. Um, so liquid nitrogen wouldn't even be able to exist in liquid state, it's so cold. And in fact, um, when Pluto's at its furthest point from the Sun, it actually has a, a very thin atmosphere uh, of, of, I believe, K 
can't remember what. There you go. But anyway, it has a very thin atmosphere. <coughs> it's furthest from the sun, the atmosphere actually freezes and, and falls to the ground as ice. So that's how cold it is. Um, okay, so let's have a bit of a look at some pictures now. So uh, here's some uh, photographs from uh, Mariner. That strip is actually not uh, um, the efforts of Mercurian developers bulldozing. Um, it's actually just where the, um, uh, the, uh, the image is missing because this is actually a mosaic of images made up. So as you can see, Mercury is quite uh, cratered, looks very much like our moon. Uh, what this is also indicative of is the fact that Venus is pretty, uh, sorry, Mercury is pretty well geologically dead. We know that on the Earth, the Earth is geologically active. We have an atmosphere actively causing erosion over time. We have earthquakes, we have volcanoes, we have uh, floods. All of these have to take their toll by eroding uh, features on the face of the planet. Um, so therefore, uh, on a planet like the Earth, if an asteroid comes <coughs> into it and makes a huge big crater, over, over hundreds of millions of years, that crater will end up more or less disappearing because of all those erosion forces erosion uh, effects caused by the atmosphere and, and such like. But Venus is pretty well dead. It doesn't have an atmosphere. I think it actually has a very thin one. Um, but for all intents and purposes it doesn't. Um, and geologically it's pretty well dead as well. So essentially you end up with a situation like the Moon where those craters just basically stay there for, for good. Next planet out. So this is uh, Venus. Now this is a, a visible light view. So this is what it looks like in visible light. This is in infrared. In infrared, it actually shows off the um, the, uh, the cloud structure more, and uh, Venus actually has a high concentration of sulfuric acid in the in its atmosphere as well. So I know the um, the uh, original Venera probe that the Soviets <laughs> sent there in the 70s. I think they had to send about six or seven of them um, by the time until they got one that worked because of the um, highly corrosive nature of sulfuric acid. Remember, this is the stuff that's in your car batteries. Um, because of the highly corrosive nature of the acid and also because of the extreme heat um, on Venus being, you know, like 400 degrees, 500 degrees, um, the spacecraft weren't lasting too long. So I think it took them about seven or eight to actually, I think the near six or seven was, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was actually the first one that they successfully got down. Yeah, and it was ten, was it? Sorry? It was about the near ten. Possibly, yeah. So it was actually quite a few of them before they you know, got one on the surface that would last long enough to send pictures back to Earth, and even then I think it only lasted for half an hour or something before it uh, um, fell over and it didn't work anymore. Now this planet here, you might have a good idea as to what this is. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I've looked at galaxies, I've looked at planetary nebulas and emission nebulas, and I've looked at Venus and watched the cloud patterns change on Jupiter. This is the most beautiful thing I reckon exists in all of the heavens. It really is when you look at it. Um, just its beauty to look at. Um, not only that, but just the amazing diversity of life. You know, billions of animal species and plant species that have evolved over the last couple of hundred million years. Um, so this is my favourite astronomical object. Anybody recognise that photograph? Uh, no, that's actually Port Phillip Bay there. Uh, once again, it doesn't come up as well on the overhead projector as it does on my screen. Uh, but yeah, essentially, you've got Port Phillip Bay here, there's um, Corio Bay there, Geelong, and there's the peninsula. We're sitting about here right at the moment. And you've got uh, Wilson's Prom there, and over here you can see Cape Otway and then the Otway State Forest over there. Um, and uh, above it, you can see space, and then that thin blue line that's all that separates us from all the uh, nasties out in space cosmic rays and so forth, that, uh, and, and UV radiation. That's the thin little bit of uh, gas that keeps us safe from all of that. This is actually a photo from the, uh, <coughs> taken from the space shuttle. And there's actually a website that you can actually get on, and uh, this is how I got this photograph. And they've got um, locations all over the Earth. So you just type in, you want a photo from space of such and such an area, and um, there's about three or four that have picked up with Melbourne. Um, and this was the was the best one. So that's quite an interesting website. This is a picture of the Earth and Moon from, uh, from space. <coughs> um, now the Moon is um, interesting too. You can see once again it looks pretty well geologically dead because of all the uh, scarring of craters that's stuck on over time. Uh, the Moon's also interesting in that it doesn't have an iron core. 
it's pretty well just solid rock. You know, what does that say to us? Well, what that says to us is that the moon couldn't have formed as a normal uh, moon during the creation of the solar system. Um, instead, what scientists think actually happened is that um, when the Earth was in its embryonic stage and, and still forming a really hot molten rock, um, the Earth actually got hit by some massive object from out of sp from out of space and actually blasted off a bit of this still sort of molten uh, rock and material into space. And over time, that cooled down and solidified into a nice spherical shape that we now call the Moon. Um, so that's the theory as to how our Moon got to be. And uh, that's actually Buzz Aldrin. Picked a nice sunny day. And that's a picture of the Apollo 17 lander. So, just through that for a bit of fun. Okay, next planet out from Earth is Mars. And um, I'm going to give a movie here. This is actually a mosaic of um, shots taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And what they did is they uh, sort of, with computer uh, imaging, uh, formed it into like a, a 3D or a, an actual sphere. And uh, were able to, using computer animation, rotate it around and look at the various, look at the pole, look at the equator. So it's actually not a real sort of picture of Mars. It's not like somebody's gone out there and whizzed around in a spaceship that fast and taken a video. Um, but what is interesting about it, it shows Mars's um, polar cap quite prominently, carbon dioxide ice composed of. Um, also, you can see these dark markings on the surface of Mars, and I think that's, what do you reckon, that's probably surface major, something like that. Yep, looks fairly major. Um, and uh, basically, these are the, the markings are just a result of uh, different um, compositions of the soil, I guess, so having slightly different shapes. <coughs> um, and you also notice that um, Mars has uh, what, what they call, oh, this is handy, PCs just locked up, have out of It didn't like running that video, did it?
the sun's was projected up at the Peter yeah. Norman telescope, you can see the sun's what? That's cloud that's touching past all the time. So, um, so there it was. And there's a couple of other small spots there. I don't know if you quite see this one up there. Uh, <coughs> bear with me. Um, just the day started off quite well with um, a small gathering turning into a large gathering, and the small gathering started out with uh, one telescope. <laughs> and, um, Is that March? I know that's. Um, Simon's okay. and there's Simon and James says, oh, can I have a look? There we are. And so the day progressed a little further and Roger got into the act and set up their uh, lady girl. Is he in focus?
So, Mars the movie is just about started, so we're back. <laughs>
with this collection of minerals which the NASA scientists had collected. And it was a major training ground which Shoemaker set up in from 1960s to train the astrogeologists, including, um, what was his name, Schmidt? Harrison. Like we Harrison we heard about a month ago. And here I shot, as I raced up the steps, with my brolly, I took a shot at the stone on the wall, and somewhere in there is some coastite, if you can find it, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a rough, when you're desperate, these things you do it at the time. <laughs> and we met this lovely bloke, and he'd met the astronauts, and he said the astronauts were there for six weeks, and they lived on Bavarian beer. And, uh, <laughs> and we didn't have time to drink Bavarian beer, but we had to race back to the bus. But this was the view on the top that we took. Um, of the view of the meteorite crater 25 k in diameter from the centre tower 90 metres up 350 flaming steps. <laughs> <laughs> here, here's a block pointing at the meteorite crater and it's the most worked over uh, meteorite crater in the world and that's where they trained Schmidt and his mates. <laughs> structures over here 
Um, and uh, what they are, they look incredibly like, um, well, canyons that um, uh, we think, and geologists think, could only have been created by the flow of liquid. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why we think liquid water must have existed on Mars in the past. We have reason to believe there's, there's liquid water locked up inside the soil, uh, but there's certainly no uh, liquid or water existing in a liquid state on Mars today. So this is one of the biggest mysteries of the solar system. Um, so the fact is that geologists can't explain the presence of these features without there having been a liquid, most likely water, uh, present on Mars' surface at some stage in its distant, distant past. And of course what that means is when you've got water, you've got a pretty damn good chance that you might have had life there once because we, as we know from um, the story with the Earth, water is basically where it all began in terms of um, the development of life. The other interesting thing Mars, uh, about Mars is um, these little pimples here, these are actually volcanoes. Um, and Mars actually has one river of a volcano, Olympus Mons. It's about 28 kilometres high. So our Mount Everest is about 8 kilometres, 8 or 8. Um, and I think Olympus Mons is about, around about 28, 25, 28 k's high. And you might think that's a high mountain, so you could be standing up on the top of it and have some fantastic views. But it's actually, I think, around about 300 k in diameter. So if you were standing on the summit of Olympus Mons, the actual gradient is so slight that you actually have, they say, you'd have trouble distinguishing what direction is uphill and what direction is downhill. Maybe not if you were standing on the summit, but if you were standing on the flank, the fact is the gradient is so slight, even though it's 28k high, the fact that it's so slight, because it's 300k around, you'd have trouble working out which is uphill and which is downhill. I reckon they should cover the area of solar frames. Olympus Mons? Yeah. Quite possibly. So, so we've looked at uh, the inner four planets, and um, I'm going to look at now the, um, the outer four uh, gas giants. Now, as opposed to the last four planets, which are made out of uh, purely rock and uh, an iron core, the gas giants, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, are, we think, almost entirely a ball of gas. Um, I believe there's some sort of speculation that, that, that they might have some, some small uh, rock or iron cores, but for all intents and purposes, it's a, it's a big ball of gas. In fact, if Jupiter had have been, um, I don't know what the exact figure is off the top of my head, but let's say um, 100 times more massive than it is, it actually would have been, become a small star. Because that's the only difference between a gas giant like Jupiter and, and our Sun, is the fact that the Sun was just big enough and massive enough and hot enough to catch on fire. Poor old Jupiter, it didn't quite make it to that sort of size. So it wasn't hot enough for nuclear reactions to start raging. So in effect, um, Jupiter is just a, a failed star, if you like. Um, okay. So you can see um, Jupiter has obviously got a very active atmosphere, as you can see by the cloud patterns here. This is the great red spot that pretty well everyone's probably read about, which is a storm two or three times the size of the Earth that's been going for about the last 300 years. Um, and um, you can see also here numerous smaller storms. Now these storms come and go. Um, and the beauty about, uh, well, one of the things I enjoy about astronomy is actually watching all this stuff happen through your telescope. Jupiter actually rotates once every 10 hours. Um, and um, because it's so huge, it's 140,000 k's in diameter, that means it's really hooting around. And what that means is that through your telescope from your backyard, you can actually go look at Jupiter and see the cloud patterns on it, Go back, say, even as, even as small as, say, five minutes, but say, half an hour or an hour later, and you can see noticeable differences that the planets rotated and cloud patterns have changed slightly. Um, and that's certainly one of my, uh, my favourite um, indulgences in the hobby, is watching Jupiter. Is that picture taken through your telescope? No, this picture was taken through my telescope. Like that, so, um, yeah. Good effort. Yeah. So, um, these are, there's some shots of Jupiter taken from Voyager, but the main purpose of this slide is to show you Jupiter's rings. Jupiter actually has a very small ring system, just like Saturn, um, but it's actually so small and faint that we can't actually see it from Earth, because from Earth we actually see the glare of Jupiter, which is actually so bright so as to blot out the, the faint rings. But Voyager, when it flew behind Jupiter, as it went past Jupiter, actually could look back Remember, you're looking at the dark side of Jupiter, so there's no glare to look at, um, and could actually see 
the rings um, glowing in the sunlight from behind. So Jupiter does have a small ring system. And uh, here's uh, one of my favourite photos of Jupiter. Once again, not very sharp on the big screen. Um, but it's, um, it's actually taken via Hubble. It's only black and white, um, but it actually shows beautiful wealth of detail in the, um, in the cloud bands. You have to look at all these swirls. And all of this is constantly changing in uh, Jupiter's uh, atmosphere. Just the pattern of clouds and storms that come and go. These little blotches here are storms that you can, you can watch through your telescope. And there's Io up there, Jupiter's, uh, Jupiter's innermost moon. Um, and you can actually see here, this is the shadow, Io is actually casting on Jupiter um, from the sun. By the way, Peter, because we sort of have that delay, if you want to break it whenever for interval, just let me know and I can finish like that. Um, now this is a sequence of photographs taken back in 96 when Comet Shoemaker Levy, can't remember the number, nine, slammed into Jupiter. Uh, we had about a year's advance warning of this, that this was going to happen. This comet was on collision course for Jupiter. And the best bit about it was it split up in a whole heap of bits. So we're going to see them go bang, 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 one after the other, straight into Jupiter. And this is the first time in modern <coughs> history that we'd actually been able to observe this event in front of our eyes. Unfortunately, I was up into uh, jumping out of aeroplanes at the time, and my interest in, in astronomy had elapsed, so I didn't actually watch this, and that's something I'm sorry about. But lots of people all around, all around the world watch this happen. And what you've got is um, a series of photographs, starting from this one here before the comet hit. This one here, you can see the first, uh, looks like the first two impacts, and then you can see further, uh, <coughs> further evidence as, as the planet's rotating around. You can also see how um, where bits of the comet have actually rotated in the interview, so they've hit just before it's been in view, and then Jupiter's rotated a bit, and then we've got to see them. Um, and then up the top there, you can actually see how um, the um, the atmosphere is, or the um, smoke, or whatever, <coughs> the smoke is sort of dissipating into the atmosphere after the uh, the bits of the comet actually hit. Is that a bit of the comet at the bottom there? No, um, that is actually um, one of Jupiter's moons coming out of um, eclipse. Yeah, interesting too. What Peter was saying before, these little sheets here give you actually the timings and details for when Jupiter's moons go in and out of eclipse, and do transits and, and eclipses on Jupiter. So once again, this is another fascinating, fascinating aspect of astronomy through a, a you know. A, uh, a moderate size telescope, 6, 8 inch telescope, whatever, you can actually watch these moons um, actually come out from behind Jupiter or, or, go, or go behind Jupiter or, or go in front of Jupiter and then watch them as they transit across the face of Jupiter. So um, once again, the data on these sheets actually gives you the information to know when to actually look or predict when these uh, events happen. Um, so that's probably eye on something coming out of an eclipse. Would have been an added bonus at the time. <coughs> Jupiter's got about 16 main moons, but um, four moons we call the Galilean moons, so called because Galileo discovered them with his first telescope in the 1600s. And um, so you've got Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Interesting to note, Jupiter's largest moon is actually larger than Mercury. Um, now, um, the interesting two, though, are Io and Europa. I'm going to talk a little bit about them next. Uh, Io and Europa are both unique in the solar system. Io, because it's the most volcanic, volcanically active object in the solar system. This is actually a false colour view, so don't get too impressed. Um, but um, this is a false colour view of uh, what Io looks like. And you can actually see it's covered in uh, these volcanoes. And the yellow colour of Io comes from the fact that there's a continuous outpouring of volcanic um, material out of um, Io's core. And, um, of course, uh, one of the main components of that is sulphur. So that's what gives it the yellow colour. Um, this little photo up here on the left is actually a photo taken by Hubble from Earth orbit. And what you can actually see here, if you look very carefully, is a tiny little plume of a volcanic eruption blasting up into space. So we're actually seeing that from Earth, volcanic eruption on Io, three quarters of a billion kilometres away. So I'm betting that's one heck of an eruption. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and the reason why uh, Io is so volcanically active is the fact that Jupiter is incredibly massive. 
Um, and Io is extremely close to it. And as it orbits around extremely close to it, like the oceans on Earth are influenced by the, the, um, or the tides of the oceans are caused by the Earth moon, so too is um, Io influenced by Jupiter's gravitation because it's so <coughs> massive. And what actually happens is that um, as Jupiter goes, uh, sorry, as Io goes around Jupiter, the inside of it, because of Jupiter's massive gravity, actually gets churned up and heated. And um, the, um, at, the, at the, the core of Io, that um, basically results in it being molten and in a very uh, disturbed state. So hence that's why um, you get all these explosions, uh, because basically um, as Io goes around Jupiter, Jupiter's doing a um, sort of a bear hug on it, a gravity bear hug. Um, Europa, at the opposite end of the spectrum, is interesting because um, we believe Europa to be covered by a crust of water ice. Um, this is a, a close-up photograph of um, Io's, oh, sorry, what Europa looks like uh, on the surface. And all these lines that you can see are actually like uh, fault lines from uh, where ice has been crushed and moving around because of uh, tidal forces. And um, so you can see all these fault lines here. This is perhaps similar to what maybe if you flew over Antarctica and, and saw all sort of ice packs moving around and crashing into each other and, and um, uh, bulging up fault lines. Um, and, and that's actually what uh, the effect that you're looking at here. And um, once again, scientists suspect that because of Europa's proximity to Jupiter and um, the, uh, the gravity exerted by Jupiter on Europa means that at the core of Europa, there is going to be a fair bit of warmth in, in its core. So it's that warmth that scientists suspect that underneath this uh, uh, thick crust layer of ice, it actually may be warm enough inside Europa to actually cause water to be able to exist in a liquid state. Once again, where you've got liquid water, you've got a possibility of life developing. So um, NASA have actually got a, a mission, uh, I think they'll want to get there in the next 10 or 15 years or something like that, to actually go to Europa, sit a spacecraft down on it, drill down into the surface and actually see whether they can actually drill down far enough to find liquid water. Um, and who knows, it may be that um, the core of Europa is hot enough that there is a liquid water ocean and there may be all these uh, alien jellyfish and, 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 and fish swimming around that we, we never knew about. So that's why um, scientists are very interested in Europa. Okay, so the next planet, uh, planet out is Saturn. I was trying to say planet and Saturn together and it didn't quite work. Um, so everybody knows Saturn because um, it's the one that has the rings and it's the one that uh, we always see on uh, drawings done by four-year-old school kids. Um, and I guess it's, it's so popular because it's, um, it's so well known because of its ring system. Now I'm going to ask a question here. I'd like somebody to tell me, given that the diameter of Saturn's ring system is a quarter of a million kilometres. So from there across to there is 258,000 odd kilometres. Um, now, if anybody answered this question when I did this talk last, please don't um, answer. So, I'm open to suggestions. Anybody got any ideas? About 100 kilometres. So, you reckon Saturn's rings are about 100 kilometres? Any advances on that? Uh, ten. One, One kilometres. One kilometre. So the answer is only about 10 metres. <laughs> so, you're talking about these rings that are a quarter of a million kilometres in diameter, but they're only about 10 metres thick. That's the width of, that's not, um, not even the width of this room. Um, so that's quite Where can you get that figure? That's the latest figure, is it? Uh, well, that's the figure that I got off the Nine Planets website. Well, the um, figure that I've been dealing with is three to five kilometres. Is it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, there you go. I think it's one kilometre, but there are so many of them together, and you put it together, it's one kilometre. Yeah. It's the same thing. You advance on three or five kilometres down to ten metres, isn't it? <laughs> well, it is actually. It's a, it's a rather big difference. But, um, well, I mean, you never know. These leap, leaps of knowledge do occur. <laughs> well, that's right. So, well, there you go. I can only be as accurate as uh, where I got all this. Hopefully, I'll check the last source. Well, that's very much. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, the, the Nine Planets website is a website run by a couple of the uni uh, universities in the United States. It's yeah. a good, very, very good website for um, yeah. all sorts of info on the solar system. Mm. So, uh, but that's interesting, man. I'll, uh, I'll check up on that. Yeah, actually, Russell, we, we might break for tea now. Uh, that, that could be a discussion uh, point uh, over tea break. No worries. Um, what, uh, what we'll do is, uh, because uh, we've shuffled some of the sessions forward, um, after tea break we'll come back in here uh, probably around 20 to 10, and uh, Russell can then uh, continue on, and we'll have the sessions uh, after that. Uh, we'll be going next door for the, uh, the tea break, and we'll uh, draw the raffle maybe next door in, in the tea break. What are you going to do now? Okay, yeah, we're going to draw away. Before you all run away, Bruce, how are you? Pick a ticket. And number 51. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Yeah, but not by the way, Not if I'm a fool, you know. Red Star is my little bit better, much. 
it back to your house? Uh, well, it was convenient for you, Darrell, and I'm happy to just bring it back here at the next
I just went to the, the ladder. Ten minutes to go to finish up the sound system. Yeah, and then he's got
and then next month he will then start uh, extra solar system instead. So what we'll do here is uh, Ian Horn will give the usual uh, what goes up and then we'll uh, follow that by Peter Lowe uh, telling us all about the astrology which uh, should be quite uh, enlightening and uh, then uh, we'll follow that up. Then, then we'll uh, follow that afterwards by uh, Sky for the Month. Well, Hill isn't here, but uh, David Gilder is off to actually present his uh, slides. Um, and then after Sky for the Month, we'll do some of the other uh, segments as well, like uh, Ian may, may now be able to do his. And uh, so I, I would think we will go until probably 25 past or half past 10 at the latest. Uh, if for some reason it's getting too late for you, uh, please feel free to get up and uh, <laughs> come out if, uh, if you're getting a good time. Okay, well on that, uh, I'll leave the technology you in. I don't know, what goes up for August 2002? A fairly quiet uh, month in terms of launches into Earth orbit. First, July the 3rd, the day before American Independence Day, Delta II launched from Cape Canaveral, um, which is just next to Kennedy Space Center. And its launch was an extremely interesting one, the Comet Nucleus Tour, or Contour, which was designed to go on a, uh, a, an odyssey, if you like, um, moving very close to a number of comet nuclei and taking very close observations of comets in the inner solar system. Unfortunately, after about a month of orbiting Earth in a highly elliptical orbit, orbit they fired the uh, main engine of the spacecraft in order to separate it from Earth orbit and promptly lost contact with it. They believe it's been destroyed. What we've got here is an image taken by the Space Watch telescope in the United States, and they've used an image subtraction technique to actually look for very faint moving objects close to Earth orbit. These four circles here represent what they detected. These black and white streaks are actually the same object imaged twice. But because we have four of them, they found two objects in close proximity to each other. This indicates that the spacecraft probably blew up when they fired the main thrusters. So at the moment, the theory is that there was a fault in the rocket nozzle and the contour spacecraft basically blew into at least two major parts. What are those so, uh, they're, they're stars. You can see the little bit of uh, Here. Yeah. These would be the brightest stars in the background. And this is a, well, the sort of optic, optical starring you get um, in photographs or, uh, or in fact visually sometimes if you've got bad eyes like mine. <laughs> Unfortunately, an unsuccessful mission for something that was going to be quite interesting. Um, standard Ariane 5 commercial launch from Kororu in French Guiana in South America. Still pretty much cornering the geosynchronous um, space satellite launches, the European Space Agency. Stellat 5, a standard communication satellite, television satellite for France, and NSTAR, which is a mobile phone and data relay communication satellite for Japan. So Ariane 5 being at the moment, uh, apart from the shuttle, the largest and most powerful launcher um, on Earth. July the 8th, the Cosmos 3M spacecraft from the Russians' um, Pletsek um, base, which is uh, near Archangel in Russia's north. It's their primary military base. And the uh, payload were military communication satellites. The Russians place a lot more reliant reliance on low earth relay satellites, whereas the Americans for their military communications almost exclusively use geosynchronous satellites, although they did sign a contract with the Iridium Mobile Phone Corporation. You, those of you who've been around for a while have heard me talk about the Iridiums a lot. And you know that that company went bankrupt um, late last year. And part of the way that they managed to reflect themselves was that the American military agreed to buy 5,000 handsets. Um, so American uh, soldiers can make telephone calls to each other in the middle of the desert as they prepare to go and dump poor old Saddam Hussein again. So they're actually using them now? Right? They're using them. They don't like them. They didn't want them. They're not part of their communications plan, but because the government needed to keep the company afloat, they signed the deal anyway. Because they're not secure. 
So they probably use it for calling home, <laughs> but not for real military purposes. The Russians have been quite active. Second launch of Proton K, which is the Russians' most powerful uh, booster. The Russians are uh, still launching reconnaissance satellites, Cosmos 2392. Of course, the Russian military and semi military program uh, began with Cosmos 1 in 1960, and they've just rolled out the numbers ever since then, <laughs> up to 2392. This is a, a, a large reconnaissance satellite. The Russians still use film return satellites because they believe it gives better image quality than the digital methods we believe the United States spacecraft use. They also sell a lot of their um, uh, imagery to commercial sources. The shuttle free fleet is grounded at the moment, which means that the International Space Station crew currently on the ISS is due to rel for relief, or they were due to for relief in September, uh, will either have an extended stay or return via um, the Soyuz spacecraft dock to the ISS rather than the shuttle. About uh, six weeks ago, maybe actually two months ago, a, a keen inspector, eagle-eyed fellow, discovered a tiny little crack in one of the main fuel lines in the main engines of the uh, sh space shuttle. I think he discovered it in, on discovery of all space shuttles. He saw it basically by accident, and for a day he was the only person who, everyone else he brought in to say, there's the crack there, and no one else could see it. Because this guy apparently has extraordinary vision. It wasn't until they brought microscopes in that they could see, hang on, yes, there are cracks. In the fuel lines, they had punched dimples into the lines to control the flow of the liquid hydrogen fuel through the fuel line. Um, if you've got dimples around the outside of a, of a uh, or the inside of a tube, it helps the lamellar flow of the uh, fluid through that. But apparently they punch square holes in it. So at the corners of the squares you get stresses building up and micro fractures have begun to appear. This guy found them and it's damn lucky that he did because they found them in all four shuttles now. Uh, the potential for a disaster, this guy apparently has been fated by the American press as the man who prevented another challenger disaster. And in fact he may well have done that because if a fuel line had ruptured during takeoff, uh, that's it, the, the whole thing goes up in a ball of flames. Um, one of the interesting things about it is that they're repairing it using welding techniques. And this is the guy actually doing it. This is Jerry, I can't remember his second name. This is the only man in the world qualified to weld on the space shuttle. He is the most qualified, he's the best welder on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Says NASA, apparently. The only man they will trust to weld these fuel lines. Apparently, because of this incident, they've suddenly realised that they'd better train some other guys because if he gets in a car accident, they're in big trouble. He had to work uh, 18 hours a day in the middle of a heavy flu, and he's still doing it. Um, they hope the shuttles will be back in service within a couple of months, but they're certainly giving no guarantees. Thanks to Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's, it appears as if the, the station, the crew of the station will be three forever. They've pretty much dumped ideas of bringing the crew size up to six or seven because they have cut the funding for their um, lifeboat. They were building something called the X-34, uh, I think, uh, which was going to be a test bed for a lifeboat that could bring six people back at once. But <coughs> they've actually cut the funding to that, so they've only got the Soyuz capsule return. The Russians don't build enough of them for there ever to be two docked to the station. And because the policy is that you've got to have lifeboats for the people to get off in case something goes wrong, um, it appears now as if they're living more than three people on the station, mm -hmm. unless the shuttle is also docked, in which you can have up to 13. Mm -hmm. yep. Does that mean when this guy's finished his welding repairs that the shuttles will all be Jerry built? <laughs> 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 you probably uh, saw on the news that um, the world's first successful test of a scramjet or hypersonic <laughs> engine was performed in the desert of Wurrung by a University of Queensland team. Um, there have been many attempts to build scramjet engines. This is the first one where they've got data which indicates the thing may have actually turned on and provided thrust for all of four seconds, I believe. This is its flight profile. It's launched on a Terrier missile, which is actually an old U.S. Navy um, anti-air um, missile. It uh, goes up to an altitude of 300 kilometres and then dives back down. And right down here, right, 
Point 11 is where they started the experiment. There's where the engine gets turned off, there's where it gets turned off. They just get the data back in time before, whack, it uh, hits the desert <laughs> 400 kilometres away from the launch site in Woomera. So if you have a look here, um, ex uh, start experiment at 200, uh, 527 seconds, stop experiment at 533 seconds. So uh, a very short period of time, so a fairly uh, large uh, amount of effort to test the engine, but um, the technology is, uh, if we can uh, master it, it, it should make access to space much easier and the possibility of flying things like ballistic parts to London, so it's three hours to London, um, you know, hour and a half across the Pacific. Uh, because if you think about it, in the last 40 years, we simply have not made our aircraft go any faster. It takes just as long to get to England now as it did 40 years ago. And we've made virtually no progress in that respect. Um, the Concorde's been the only attempt to do it. It's pretty much been a dismal failure in terms of the cost efficiency of it. So the scramjet's uh, an attempt to perhaps uh, move away from the, the sort of the 600, 700 kilometre hour limit that our airliners currently have. Although it's a long way from being a, <coughs> a feeding of technology. And uh, that in fact is, is all in terms of space reporting this month. It's been quite, quite a quiet month. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, just before I start, uh, about, about a month ago, a shop in Friesland that was selling quite good quality binoculars, quite cheap. And I know some of the members went out and bought some of these. And they actually they started off at $25 and they went down to 20 and then they went at 15 and some people actually got them at 10 And knowing that people would miss out, I went out and bought a pile of these things at $15. Uh, and um, so if anyone would like to buy one of these things, um, come and see me out. What size are they? Uh, they're only small things, they're 10 by 25, but the thing about them is the, the fact that they are quite good quality. So they're obviously, they're obviously the leftovers. Uh, they're, uh, they're a Hanamex, 10 by 25. Small field of Peter Skilton asked me some time back to, to give a uh, talk, we couldn't quite figure out what the talk would be, so he dared me to give a talk on astrology. And uh, being one for the days, I thought, oh, okay, I'll, I'll give a talk on the scientific basis of astrology. Uh, and of course, we're all believers in astrology, so I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to be in. Uh, <coughs> Now, in recent times, we've had uh, some really interesting effects. What I'd like to do is, I want to, I want to talk about the, the basis of truth. Now, one of the things that, um, in science, we're talking about the scientific basis, in science we don't talk about truth. Um, we talk about truth in philosophy. Um, in science we talk about facts and how we prove uh, the, the, the facts. Um, in, in the um, news of late, this is uh, uh, a building in Prague, and um, you can't quite see it too well there, but there's a whole bunch of sandbags, and that building's about to get uh, flooded from all the floods in Europe. Uh, similarly, in Germany, we've had uh, recently had floods. Uh, I think that's in Czechoslovakia. We've had heavy rains in the Middle East with uh, a lot of people being killed in landslides. Excuse and me, but that first picture is not Prague. Isn't it? No, I'm from Prague. Okay, well, where is it? I don't know, I don't know, but it's not Prague. Okay, it's, it's, it's from Europe. Hungary. Europe. Hungary. <laughs> Sounds like a good bit. Um, <laughs> it could be, it could be Prague. Um, and, and so we've had all sorts of, um, of uh, weather related problems. For the last. Uh, 50, more than 50 years we've been measuring the composition of the atmosphere and 
that's showing the, um, the uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. You can see it. in the 1900s, we were down to uh, 295 parts per million. Then the, the, the risen in <coughs> 1940 has been progressively rising uh, each year. If we look at global temperatures, um, and this is from the uh, National Climate Center in, in America, you can see that uh, globally, We've, we've been seeing a, a steady rise in temperatures, and the highest temperatures have been in the last couple of months, the uh, last couple of years. So, I'd like to ask the question, how many people believe that all those floods and weather-related effects were due to climate change? Anyone want to put their hand up and say, yep, we believe the climate's changing? Can't say that for Nobody truth. Nobody believes the climate's changing. Can't say that for truth, can you? How many people believe it's due to global warming? How many people believe in global warming? Well, <laughs> might be believing global warming, but whether that's causing climate change. How many people believe that those floods and storms and things are just the uh, combined effects of just random variations in the, in the climate? We all believe that there's a random effect. What I want to show is that what we regard as the truth depends on the facts that we that we have in front of us and on the theoretical models that we have to explain those facts. I can, and I can show you some, some more facts. This is looking at the average or rather maximum wind speed recorded again in the States and the number of violent hurricanes recorded. Now by violent hurricanes they're talking about um, uh, hurricanes of category four and above. And category five is, is the maximum <coughs> size and we've had a few whoppers in recent years and they're talking about how they can get bigger and bigger categories. Um, what that's showing is that really we haven't had that many more storms. We haven't had uh, that much higher winds. If we look at the sea temperatures, sea temperature hasn't changed all that much. Uh, that's over 3,000 years. Um, if we look at sea level, sea level is not changing. Um, and yet we've got the government going over and, and having arguments with the uh, island nations because the island nations are saying we're going to disappear because of sea level change. Um, there's no doubt sea level does change, but over that period of time it doesn't look like it's changing too much. Where, where was that mission though? Uh, no, I couldn't really tell you. Yeah, I know. Wouldn't, wouldn't matter. Well, <laughs> it, it's it, it's uh, <coughs> I might have to be measured at some sort of reference point. So these are all island states. Now this is an interesting one. This is the the temperature variance from me in the states uh, versus the length of the solar cycle, right? The solar magnetic cycle length, and that appears to correlate up. On the basis of that, you'd say, that, well, maybe the weather's not changing. Maybe, maybe what we've done is just select the evidence a bit, um, a bit selectively, and uh, and proven the point that we want to make. And I think, to a degree, that's what we that's what we're doing. Um, well, I, I should have pointed out, if you look at the temperature. Now, I had a temperature graph before that showed that the global temperature was rising. This is another one. Uh, of the last hundred years, uh, which is supplied by the Weather Bureau. The, the other one was supplied by the EPA. Um, and that one, the, this one is showing that the, weather, the temperature is not changing. But it depends on the facts that you have and the models that you use to interpret those facts. And uh, in terms of global warming, uh, I think the facts not in. Um, we can point to things that are certainly changing, but whether that global warming is necessarily natural or human or whatever um, depends on the facts that you have and the models we use. One of the things that you get from that is, and this is a, the American EPA site, is you get people that use those facts and use 
use those for political reasons. So if you look on the EPA, um, American EPA uh, uh, website, it will tell you all about global warming, it will tell you all about the disasters that are going to hit us and how the, the uh, polar ice caps are melting and all that sort of thing. If you go to the American Weather Bureau, they tell you the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And that's because the story, their truth, is, is uh, uh, I won't say politically motivated, but they have a particular story they want to tell, so there's a particular set of facts and a particular set of models that they use to put it in front of you. Now when we come to it's spin. It's spin, that's the spin doctrine, it's exactly that. Now when we come to the medieval world, there's absolutely no difference. Um, the time scale might be a little different, but basically it's the same story. Um, back in the the uh, medieval world, people did not understand <coughs> cause and effect uh, phenomena. In fact even uh, it's interesting if, if you go and read some of the transcripts for the trials of the well, trial of Galileo. Most of the problems that Galileo had was nothing to do with his astronomical observations and, and the fact that he was stupid enough to write books for that. Um, most of it was because he was using what the church regarded as um, illogic. He was using a particular set of deductive reasoning which. Today we would call it scientific method, but at that time was regarded as rather stupid, and uh, so most of the argument was over the fact that he was making illogical conclusions. So they didn't really have a good model for for deductive reasoning, and they also didn't have a good understanding of what was going on around them. And a lot of things were being driven by spirits and essences, and you know, you had the Lady of the Lake type uh, effects. They also lived in a two-part universe. Down on the earth, everything was temporary. The, the life, death, decay, everything was in constant change and was therefore imperfect. Up in the sky, you had unchanging stars. Highly predictable. Stars every year, the same stars came around. And uh, the whole thing was extremely predictable. And <coughs> for philosophical reasons, must be perfect. Any changes in this, that, that occurred uh, in the sky, so anything they saw that changed, couldn't possibly have occurred in the amongst the stars because that was an, in, uh, uh, an unchanging area. So it had to occur close to the Earth. Um, and the, and uh, they saw these things as fundamentally atmospheric phenomena, so comets, nova, meteors, that type of thing, were, were basically seen as atmospheric. So what were the facts? The facts were that the seasons were changing predictably, and they were changing predictably under the reign of certain constellations. So, in Orion, you had all the winter. Every time Orion came up, winter. Every time it was spring, we had winter. Um, the plants uh, metamorphosed in, in conjunction with the constellations. So, yeah, every spring. We know what happens to the plants in spring. We know what happens to the plants in winter. Um, you get your food in summer. So the environment around them was following the constellations. Animal behavior was changing with the seasons exactly the same way. Um, well, you know that all the young bucks start chasing the girls in, <laughs> in spring. So it's pretty, pretty obvious, isn't it? It's pretty obvious that the stars are driving influences on the background of uh, pattern of life the planet. Um, and people at that time would have said it's an obvious influence. Furthermore, sky events like comets and novas and things had to occur close to the, to the Earth um, because it couldn't be amongst the stars. So they had very strong influences on us. And they, they foretold um, important events. The, um, the, uh, what's the term here? I was going to say the nigger in wood but I'm not allowed to say that. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the problem that they had was that there were other, there were other uh, uh, stars that moved around the planets. And these things moved around unpredictably in amongst the fixed stars. And we know from our general experiences that the stars were having an influence on us. And therefore, these moving planets 
must be having a moving influence. That is, that as they move around on, amongst the fixed stars, they're having some sort of mitigating effect on the influence that they're having for us. So that you've got this background stars that are giving this general influence, but the planets are having having their own individual influences. Um, and so there was some sort of subtle effect that the planets were doing. So you can see that the life's characteristics were being set by the fixed stars when you were born, but then the, but then the uh, particular stars that were in dominance at, the, at the, uh, this moment of time and the planets were having some sort of mitigating effect. Now, one of the things you probably don't uh, realise is that the Astronomical Society of Friends actually has an official astrologer. And uh, I thought uh, what I'd do is I'd uh, uh, put together a, um, a horoscope. And this is a horoscope for um, Ian Sullivan. Or yes. I've, I, um, as I said, I don't think everybody realised he's actually an ASF astrologer. And um, uh, what you have here is uh, around the outside there are the 12 houses. Uh, of fixed, gra fixed stars inside, you have the planets and the moon and, and uh, the, um, the wandering stars. And so we know that, that uh, as of tonight, uh, 21st of August, at, uh, well, I had it at 8 p.m., but we're running a bit late. Um, uh, this was going to be the, um, the horoscope. The, these are the uh, matrices for working out which um, behavioural characteristics are influenced by what um, houses. And from that, you can work out the, um, the uh, uh, horoscope of the person. And I was quite amazed when I, when I ran this through the computer, <coughs> looked at the horoscope, and it said Ian Sullivan was born under the influence of Mercury, and he was destined to, to around the world chasing the sun and the moon. <laughs> And to become a teacher of wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that's a nice that's that really cool. Excuse me, Peter. I'd just like to know how are you talking so well with your tongue in cheek? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the other thing that absolutely clinched it for me, like before this I was just was not a word. It actually flinched it. it was it said that uh, that as of tonight it's gonna be the next day at the top. So I will hand over to you.
I think just about everybody here, if anybody here hasn't seen the uh, Williamstown Time Ball, one or two, shame on you. I don't know how the other side of the river, round, round the, round the yeah, bay. Yeah, right, right, right. Right. They must do that. Everybody must see that. Uh, it's been there for over 100 years, and it was put up as a, a basalt lighthouse tower. It was hardly a lighthouse at all for very long, and the Time Ball went on it. The Time Ball was taken down in 1934, <coughs> and Navigation lights were on it for about 40 years or so. In 50 years, in 1990, um, they replaced the tower. They used to have a tower up there. There was a tower, navigation lights, took it down and restored the time wall because of the historic uh, uh, something of heritage value for the community. And they, that's not the original time wall, unfortunately, but they had to fabricate one. Uh, but, but the idea was there and the tower is there. And in a number of places around the world, time wars got started in the early 1800s uh, for shipping. The idea was to, was before the days of time signals, so you had a situation whereby an observatory would, would standardise to, would have a means of standardising time by watching a star cross the meridian, which we won't go into tonight, we'll do it another day. But the idea of the star crossing the meridian, and at the moment of crossing the meridian, that can be timed with an accurate clock, and in those days they were pendulum clocks, and of course it would be a sidereal clock in an observatory, and then they'd get the tossing of that same star the next night, and the next night, and they would keep that pendulum clock on accurate time. Now, the observatory then would have to convey that message to the time ball, to a keeper or somebody at the time ball, and either automatically or by manual arrangement, they'd drop the ball. The ball is a standard procedure all around the world was to raise the ball to five minutes to one, or perhaps three minutes to one, or something like that. But the standard time for dropping the ball was 1 p.m. every day. Uh, down at Williamstown, they did it at six days a week. They didn't do it on a Sunday. So they did that. And the idea, of course, of any ship that happened to be an anchor in the, in the bay could see the drop. They'd have their telescope on it. They would be watching their chronometer on board ship. And they would be able to then check their chronometer. And that was very important because your chronometer keeps time and only by means of your chronometer are you able to know longitude at sea. And of course you saw that program uh, the, uh, uh, that was broadcast. We, we had a couple here and uh, you saw it with that interesting program about longitude. Anyway, there's the Williamstown time ball and everybody should see it. Uh, next. There in Sydney, there's the time ball is actually on Sydney Observatory. So if you go to Sydney, you go to Sydney Observatory and see the time ball. And there it is there. And you see the transits, it's a telescope to actually observe the crossing of the meridian on a star. It's a transit telescope. They have one in Sydney, a working telescope there. And of course, Sydney, and you have your time ball and your transit telescope at the one place. Whereas, of course, it never was at the one place. From that Sorry, it was at the one place for 10 years at Williamstown because there was the observatory was at Williamstown from 1853 to 1863. But then, of course, they moved to Melbourne Observatory and the signal had to go by telegraphic signal from Melbourne Observatory down to Williamstown. Well, here at Sydney, they had the time ball, time ball at the observatory right in town uh, on one side of the, uh, the harbour. There's those slits there, those transit slits, uh, which, of course, open up and the transit instrument can then uh, look at the sky when the time arrives. So if you go to Sydney, you can still see, you can still see that today. Next. Uh, now if you go to Adelaide, this is the travel I've done in the last, just in the last year or two. If you go to Adelaide, you go to a suburb of Adelaide called Semaphore, uh, aptly named, and they had a time ball there, and again it had to be reconstructed. The tower was there, and falling into this this uh, this repair, and only in the last uh, 20 years or so they have refurbished it. Next slide, I think, tells you all about that. Here we are. It says the Stone Ball Tower was erected in 1875. Of course, that's later than Melbourne. Uh, and able, Melbourne was put up on the tower in 1860. And able ships at the anchorage in the inner harbour to raise their to rate their chronometers. The Black Ball was hoisted to the masthead 12:57 p.m. daily and dropped at 1 p.m. 
by electric release from the Adelaide Observatory, which no longer exists. It's merely a park today. It was pulled down in 1940, the Adelaide Observatory. With the advent of wireless time signals, the service was discontinued in 1932. Well, they actually stopped the service in Williamstown in 1926. Uh, the structure has been restored by the South Australian Harbour's Board to preserve a link with the past and a tribute to sea transport which played a prominent part. Right, so these things are around, and uh, when you go to Adelaide, as you can see it. Next. In Perth, uh, they've refurbished Fremantle, and there it is there, that uh, the, the Fremantles have a... And, and this is a phony time wall, but you see this sort of thing has been put up there on the mast here. Next. And here, you see, there is another one here on the bit, that, that's that same round tower. So the idea is there at uh, Fremantle, but that's all, level up, let, let it go to, it's nothing substantial. Now, when I went to New Zealand, next slide, I talk to you. went to New Zealand, there in South Island, New Zealand, the port of Christchurch is, is uh, Littleton, and the Littleton Time Hall Tower was a very elaborate, very nice setup. You see, here it is, a picture from a from a drawer, from a, <coughs> a text, uh, and a signalling flag here, uh, and there this, this uh, wonderful little building, uh, which nearly was pulled down. Uh, it was saved during the Second World War. They thought they'd better do something about it. It wasn't until the 1970s, next. And this is the Littleton Harbour, uh, which serves the South Island New Zealand. Next. And this is the little town of, uh, that's been done up a bit. There's the Littleton uh, Church, the uh, Littleton the Upper Church, and there's a cafe called Latitude. There you are. See, it's got the sign of the flag there. Next. And you see the old buildings of Littleton as the old port. Next. That's the post office building, that one. And there it is. There's the building itself sitting uh, up there on the hill. You see the tower? See the tower and the time wall? On the hill. Sits up there, looking over the uh, over the harbour next. And there's the signalling flag, the signalling mast, looking across the harbour, next. And there's the ball, uh, but which has been preserved all this time and really dark. And they have somebody on duty who actually seven days a week the place is open. They have uh, Combination actually pay the guy, they pay someone, but someone's there, you can call in and see the whole place. Next. Uh, the battlements, and you can see the ships come around the heads, and of course they can sight the, sight the uh, time board and, and the signaling plate. Very important in the old days was the signaling plate. Next. Spiral staircase, you got the tower. Next. And that's a that's <coughs> Uh, here they show, this is the, the heads they come in. The ship approaches the heads flying identification code flags. The signal in sights and approaches the ship, appro approaching ship, and signals identification code, four flags to the inner harbour. Um, with no direct line of sight, the open sea and the outer harbour flag staff that had the head and time ball were used as a communication relay. Um, Yep, and of course they could convey information by, by flags and so forth about what did in the time ball station. Yep, the time ball station had to receive signal next to uh, uh, from here it is here, the observatory in Wellington, it's called Carter Observatory. I'll show you pictures of that another day. The Littleton Post Office time seat sends the signal to the time ball tower. Here's you've got your clock. Um, uh, the batteries in the clock room provide the electric current which the circuit is completed to a magnet and a time wall mechanism. Around the magnet is wound a copper with carrying the electric current. The magnet will attract the steel plate setting the mechanism in motion. The mechanism rods and levers wheels act to pull away the release lever and the ball drops three metres in eight seconds. The time ships have to get is the moment it leaves the cross arm of the main. The ball drops the now at a known Greenwich time. On board of the ship, the masters note the error in their chronometers. They note the error, they don't hold their chronometer, they note the error so they know where the, what, what, what the reading is. Next. And this is some of the pictures of what's inside. This is in the display room there, which shows all those devices. Next. 
And that's the clock, Denton Company, right? One of these old prestigious clocks. Next. And there's the code of signals, the signalling flags, which are very important. They still exist today, and the fellow actually who was curating did know all the flag signals. He did know them all because of his background. Um, these things, of course, are going to die. They're, they're dying uh, uh, as, as people who know them, and that, that, that it's not taught to others. Anyway, there happened to be a guy working at the, uh, uh, at, in the dock, and it was his birthday. And this guy was 78 years old, it was his birthday, and he wanted to send you a birthday wish. So next slide. And he sent the birthday wish with signaling flags. <laughs> and that was all these signaling flags, and he's this guy that was hoisting, he's hoisting the flags up the mast, and that would send the message. The guy working on the docks, right, the, the, the signaling of, the, of his birthday message. Crazy stuff. So if you go to Little to you go to, to, to New Zealand, uh, this is some little place you could go and, go and visit. Well worth it. Thank you. Right, we'll have uh, two more talks and then we'll close uh, for the evening. Uh, one, uh, David will present a couple of minutes on uh, box material, if uh, you wish to. And then uh, Alfred on uh, VNG, I guess. And then we'll close for the evening. Bob's not here tonight, so I'll just whip through this fairly quickly because it's getting late. Um, these charts are, um, I don't know if we're doing it first, but you've got um, Saturn and uh, voice net over here, I can understand it better. You've got Saturn over here and Jupiter in the moon at different times of each, you want to borrow each month. Um, yep. Yep. Of each month, and uh, does that work? Can you see that? You can find that was music, it was. It's not bright enough. Not bright enough. Not bright enough. Uh, <coughs> anyway, the most significant part of um, the morning sky is, is that Saturn and Jupiter rising. Saturn's near the Crab Nebula and Jupiter's near the b made Cluster. So, something for people to, uh, to be interested in. But the best time to look at Saturn and Jupiter is in the mornings. Because nice clear air. So, uh, get out nice and early and have a look at, uh, I'll look at Saturn, on, Saturn and uh, Jupiter. On, on, on Monday, on Sunday morning. On Monday morning, sorry, it was really, really bright. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, in the evening sky, we've got Venus and uh, Mercury, and it just shows that when you see um, Venus each night, it does seem to move. It moves across the sky a little bit, and that's showing the different dates. And moving across below it is Mercury, and then the Moon as well going up. So you can't miss Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter. You can't miss uh, Venus. And Saturday night, we could see Mercury quite well, couldn't you? Very good. Um, there's the northern sky and um, all sorts of stuff, these little comments about uh, um, a lot of computer telescopes, sort of these little lovelies, whatever. <coughs> um, yeah, that's the northern sky, there's plenty to look at. Just um, is the off note, the ring nipple is quite fascinating and we've got um, Neptune and Uranus, but there's another chart showing them in a minute. The helix um, nebula is quite interesting, Saturn nebula. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, Mark Allen, who is in the other room, I showed him NGC 253 for the first time a little while back, and um, we did it in the morning, and he loved it because he used to own an old Holden with a 253 engine in it. So it's now, it's now become his favourite galaxy. So that, that's always quite interesting. I like to have little stories when it comes to uh, some of the deep sky objects. Sorry? What's it look like through the tap? Don't use the tap. Not on galaxies. No, um, there's the southern sky, and uh, most of you know it. Uh, probably the best one in the sky. I think it's 47 Ducat, and the small Magellan cloud, the large one. And um, the southern cross and the pointers. Most of you know uh, the rest of it. Um, Scorpius and Peter Lowe's here. There he is. Um, what constellation of Pluto are we? Oh, Ophiuchus. I didn't see them in the chart in the astrology thing. Ophiuchus. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, well, yeah. when they asked you what sign you're in, you should say. That's right. And just to go through it fairly quickly, I'm going to take a bit of time up. 
is Capricorn in more detailed chart of uh, Uranus and Neptune and uh, well, not far away while you're there, the Saturn Nebula on M30. <coughs> um, it's an easy part of the sky and I always like liken uh, Capricorn to a stealth bomber, not so much uh, um, a goat. So have you ever seen, ever seen um, Capricorn in the dark sky, even at the bright? It's quite interesting. In a really dark sky, it does give it that sort of shape quite easily seen and does look, I think, like a stealth bomber. And I think it looks like the goat myself. <laughs> I've never seen the goat with myself. But I've been a goat looking at it sometimes. Um, and Bob's uh, attempted uh, a moon map, which is uh, fairly interesting. And uh, this is some of the stuff we were looking at on uh, the other night from Clavius there, which was uh, very nice. And up in this region here, the Terminator was sort of running sort of down like that. So, um, yeah, and you've got uh, you've got this chart. I think it was a handout, so you can have a read of that. And that's Bob's sky for the. Uh, just a, a couple of words. I was supposed to do this earlier. Um, Marion Bright wanted me to pass on her thanks for um, people's well wishes um, to her. She is uh, obviously not coping that well. And um, thank you for the ASF for the flowers and for those people that turned up to his funeral, thank you very much. And uh, um, he, she, she asked me that any time we're out there observing at the Bryce, just have a bit of a thought on Ken because it was one of his favourite places in the world was the Bryce. And he used to love viewing with us all and he made some good friends in the society so um, obviously we'll never forget him. And uh, yeah, Marion just wanted to say thank you all for your support for her. Okay? Alfred, can I ask you to come down? Looks like we've appreciated this from the Astronomical Society of Victoria and uh, had a few things to say about uh, happenings with uh, VNG. Uh, maybe I should uh, first just follow on from, uh, <coughs> from uh, Dave. Um, Ken Bryant was also uh, um, quite well known uh, in the occultation group in uh, Melbourne because uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, observations uh, together. So uh, also a lot of respect, uh, respect for him. Uh, in the ASV that uh, a number of us uh, came to the funeral. Um, <coughs> Ian Sullivan just mentioned uh, wireless time signals. You better be quick because uh, <coughs> I might not uh, be there for that long. Um, um, <coughs> as you know, uh, uh, time is very important in any field of astronomy and as uh, Ian uh, pointed out, astronomers have always been timekeepers uh, for the world <coughs> um, for uh, centuries. So the connection is very uh, close. Um, what do we use time for? Uh, the people who are most in need of accurate time in, uh, amongst us uh, amateur astronomers are people who look at uh, changing phenomena, like uh, <coughs> things that happen quickly and things that uh, move. Um, occultations are a prime example. Um, and we have been using uh, VNG for many years. Many of you will be familiar with the, the VNG uh, beeps. Um, <coughs> Regrettably, uh, VNG will close down on the 31st of December and unless somebody can come up with a lot of money or a lot of good, good arguments for the government. Um, what can we use instead? Um, <coughs> it will start from the bottom. Um, the ABC time tips. Many of you will know that there are time tips on the ABC local radio, uh, not, on the <coughs> not on the Radio National. If you read the website, you can check on the website uh, why it is uh, like that. Um, if you are thinking of copying down the website, I have 30 copies of a handout that uh, gives you uh, all the references, so pick one up uh, afterwards. So, the radio time pips are still very good. Um, telephone time pips, only TELSAS 1194 um, are trustworthy, and only for a few more months, because TELSAS just sold that service to a commercial operator, which means it will be uh, woolly. <coughs> it will be very woolly in the near future. Um, shortwave, um, on shortwave, <coughs> If you have a good uh, shortwave receiver, you can continue using WWV and WWVF from uh, Colorado and Hawaii. However, I must warn you, sometimes there will be five minutes before the full hour and before the half hour where you hear double pips, where you hear pip, 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 pip. The second pip at the moment comes from BPM in China because BPM in China transmits uh, uh, not UTC, not coordinated universal time, but another form of universal time, UT1, during 10 seconds each, uh, um, each uh, 
10 seconds, sorry, 10 uh, minutes each hour, <coughs> just to confuse us. Once again, check the website if you want to know. Uh, and on this handout, I'll also say that if you don't have a computer, phone me up and I'll send you a printout. Um, now, <coughs> the best solution for our VNG problems is to uh, use a dedicated uh, GPS receiver. Um, all of you know that GPS receivers will uh, find your location on the Earth's surface. Um, many handheld <coughs> GPS receivers also have a time, out, a time display, but they do not have a time output and they don't beep. Um, one problem is that they don't beep. The second problem is that the time display on the liquid crystal um, can be right or can be wrong. It can be a few seconds out, uh, depending on the model and what mode it is in. So, once again, you have to be very careful how you uh, operate them. Uh, the people who, uh, the VNG User Consortium, the group of friends in Canberra and uh, in Australia and New Zealand who have been supporting VNG since 1987, um, have taken a step to, uh, um, <coughs> to commission two groups, uh, Stromlo Observatory and the University of Canberra, are both working on the development of uh, GPS time receivers. Uh, <coughs> one is concentrated on the technical aspects, the other on uh, how you could uh, manufacture one at an affordable rate. <coughs> so uh, they hope to come together um, sometime in September, October with a reasonable proposal. So you might be able to buy a little box that will go beep, beep, beep a thousand times more accurate than the VNG ever was. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> that's really uh, uh, the guts uh, for you users. If any of you are really good at electronics and have spare time <coughs> and have better eyesight than me, um, you would be uh, most welcome to uh, uh, give it a hand. Um, because apart from these GPS receivers, um, when you have a grazing occupation with say five or ten people, um, you, you often need more than one clock. <coughs> um, we have built in the past a few really basic boxes like this that go big, big, big. That is a minute and then seconds. So we have built a few boxes like this, but we need more of them and we need better ones. So if any of you is, uh, is really good at electronics, or you have a, a son or a nephew who is really good at it, um, get in touch. Uh, GPS no, no. <laughs> That's just a crystal clock. No. Um, so if you'd like to know more, ask me for one of these handouts. Thank you. All right, well, uh, at that, I'll uh, call and close to August meeting and uh, invite you all back here uh, next month for the September meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm going to stop the 
post it out now. I'll, keep, I'll email around a couple of uh, updates relating to members' emails tomorrow. Okay. Anybody else have a good time? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'll put it. Okay, well, if we're there, I'll get it. Okay, 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 I'll get it. Ok